Good to have you all here. Uh, so, Mary Ellen, are you here? Yes. Yes, there she is. She's in black and white there. Mary Ellen Hannibal was introduced to me by uh, mutual friends who are some of the, they're scientists and they're some of the most creative and intelligent people I know. And they said to me, you have to have our friend Mary Ellen Hannibal do a master class. Um, and so she did. And people loved it. And it was, and it's real. I think those of you who haven't tuned into citizen science are going, are in for a pleasant awakening. And it's particularly uh, relevant now in this period where we have this abrupt and unwanted dislocation from each other. Um, and then to realize that at the same time, we're all so importantly connected and we have to do everything we can to nurture those connections and to reconnect with, I don't know, there are birds flying around and bugs and they're just, they're having their own life and here we are messing it all up and Mary Hannibal is leading the way to correct all that. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. So I'm giving you like this uh, incredible, uh, basically uh, very fast, let me make sure I have my PowerPoint there. PowerPoint um, on citizen science. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is very broad and very uh, general and I'm touching on a number of different elements of citizen science in this. So citizen science is basically uh, regular people contributing to scientific research. And in the Western scientific tradition, and there's different scientific traditions around the world, um, our, what we think of as professional science has its roots in amateur science. So this is a sunburst of sea star that's in the collections at the California Academy of Sciences. And this is locally extinct now off the entire coast of North America, off the West Coast, due to a sea star wasting um, syndrome, which is basically a function of climate change impacts and pollution and ocean acidification and kind of a, a snapshot of our, our problems. Um, these are sand dollars in the collections. And so in the uh, 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, wealthy Europeans went around the world on trips like people do today and they brought back all kinds of stuff they had never seen before and made these curiosity cabinets uh, and showed it to each other, showed them their stuff. And, and that's this great age of exploration under was, was going on as well. So the great colonial powers, Spain, France, England, um, the Netherlands, all sent out expeditions and collected things and brought them back and made scientific, the first natural history museums. But those were all pretty much founded by amateurs. What we call, you know, a PhD in evolutionary biology didn't really exist until the 1900s. And so what they were trying to figure out is, uh, well, how did life forms come to be? And what was, what did this whole earth exist made of? And so something like these sand dollars are found all over the world. They have different, um, different characteristics that are different adaptations for surviving in their particular ecosystem. This one is from the coast of Africa. And in the academy, it, it had the, um, some of the sand that it was collected with in the uh, shelf with it. So a lot of what natural history museums have are thousands and millions and millions and millions of specimens. And partly what we're trying to discern is variation within one species. So all of these are the same kind of species of beetle. And then where do those species um, change into new species? So these, these sand dollars are all different species of sand dollars. So basically where the question is how do new life forms come into being? And that's the big question the Natural History Museum collections seek to answer. This is um, an ammonite on the left, which has gone extinct, but it was uh, back before the Jurassic, before many, many extinctions ago, it's a fossil, and had this hard outside shell, it's like a snail shell, with the animal inside it. The next to it is a chambered nautilus, which has the same structure and the animal when it's alive lives within the shell and that's an adaptation so that when predators come it's hard for them to get at the soft part of the animal. So over time when predators in the ocean started to develop bigger teeth 
some of those ammonites and nautiluses developed a different strategy and they internalized the shell. This is a cuttlefish, it's a huge picture, but the, actually that is about the size of a fingernail. And that's the inside of the animal. When the organism is alive, it's around, uh, around it. So there on the left is again a cuttlefish. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of skeletal structure. And then on the right are specimens of uh, an octopus and squid. So these are all related. They're part of the same lineage. But these animals traded out that external um, ability to withstand a predator for what was for them a more effective way of eluding predators by internalizing it and becoming very fast and masters of disguise. So this is how evolution unfolds. It's adaptations to the environment. And uh, as different species get to different places, they adapt differently. This is a finch nest from the Galapagos. Each of the islands on the Galapagos has a different shape and look to their finch nests because the vegetation on each island is different. These are very small. That's only a few inches high. And the finch nest uh, operates as a womb, partly, for the finch gestation process. When the eggs are laid in this nest, they're not ready to be hatched. It's not like sitting out like a robin's nest where the, the animal comes and sits on top of it. This also keeps the, the egg warm enough and protected enough until it is ready to, to come into, you know, to, to break the shell. What I like about this is it shows really that the outside world and the inside world are really very, very connected. And at certain points in development and life histories, they are indiscernible. Um, niche, so this nest is from the French niche, which is really gives it a sense of, of where you belong in the world. And it's not only a sense of shelter and place and protection, but also who you eat and who eats you. So where you fit in the ecosystem and how you survive. So today, citizen science is still basically collecting observations of nature to try to understand evolution, to understand how life forms came to be, and in our moment in time, to understand why and how they're going extinct so fast. And this just is a little you know, slide that shows you take a picture with a naturalist, the app helps you identify it, and then it goes on like a Facebook feed and people help um, correct your observation. And meanwhile, there is an artificial intelligence function on this app. So actually it's like taking your own master class every time you take a picture with iNaturalist because it will teach you quite often what you're looking at. Uh, during this COVID you know, quarantine, I am going to the beach almost every day. I have to drive you know, and walk in because the parking lots are off limits. And I'm, I'm looking at seabirds. So seabirds are migrating through here right now. And they're here for a few months. You can see um, on where those on the side of the, the map, I've been looking at common muirs. I've been looking at loons. All of these seabirds, um, they have evolutionary histories that go back 23, 33 million years. They've been coming to this neck of the woods even before the, sh the shoreline had the shape that it has today. They don't come on land. They don't really walk very well. They're evolved to fly and to dive. And they come here to basically lay their eggs uh, on the Farallon Islands, which are out in the ocean, but they're still close enough to San Francisco that they have a zip code that's part of a San Francisco zip code. And this screenshot is at a little bit closer um, in on iNaturalist observation. So each of those blue marks represents an observation of a common muir. So I look at this to put my own observations of muirs up there and also to see where people have seen them. Um, and one big question everybody has, which is a great one, which is about citizen science data. Like what's the data used for? Who gets to analyze it? And basically the data is there in, in iNaturalist and I can access the data to ask my own questions, to analyze my own questions about that data. For example, I can ask, you know, how many muir were seen this April versus last April. It'll be something to see with all these people um, quarantined. Will we get more observations on citizen science? I bet we will. So this is uh, moving to coronavirus. Now this, I took a couple screenshots out of a visualization, an animation that is showing the spread of the disease across the world. So up there in the right hand of this screen, you see 128, that's January 28th. 
And then down on the left, you see these color-coded numbers. So the numbers are the pinker, and then the redder, and then the black, and then the purple show bigger and bigger amounts of COVID virus. And this is, you know, it takes a couple minutes to show the whole animation, so I didn't want to do that. The next um, screenshot I took was from about a month later, and you see China now has many more cases than it did a month prior, and we're starting to see them in the United States, and now Russia has some, and Australia does. Down in the middle of the screen, you see that uh, is also being tabulated the deaths in China, deaths outside China, and the recovered in China. And then we go to another month later, and you see that this COVID virus is moving around the world really, really quickly and really intensely. And, and now we're seeing more deaths and more, but also way more recoveries. And then um, on 319, this data down in the middle of it shifted to the deaths in Italy rather than the deaths, deaths in China, because that became much more to the forefront of people's minds about how it was, what was happening. And this is basically the last screen from this, um, the particular animation, you know, this is a few days ago, so it's different today than it was then. And you see that now the United States has surpassed China in the number of cases. So this movement of the virus around the world so quickly is actually a fascinating uh, little paradigm of how we understand how all plants, animals, and organisms move around the world. Now, coronavirus and viruses have a lot to tell us about what we're doing to the environment. So what we're doing is we're destroying habitat that other creatures live in. And we're destroying habitat where animals, you know, you, I wanted you to see my TED talk because I wanted you to have already heard the story of how the monarch is co-evolved with milkweed and has learned to sequester that poison in its own body. Well, over millions of years, animals in, and plants in the tropics especially have co-evolved with viruses and they're not affected badly by the viruses at all because they've survived them over millions of years. When we destroy that habitat, those animals go away. So the first thing we have is you know, the extinction crisis, but the viruses don't go away. The virus just looking for another host and they find one you know, walking around on two feet while holding a smartphone in, in his or her hand. And that's where we are today. And that's why this is happening. <laughs> So one of the things to not have this happen again, uh, and it probably will happen again, is to stop with all the habitat destruction and understand a lot better what we're doing when we take that out. So there's a lot going on in the citizen science world in response to COVID. This is, and it works basically the same way. Underneath all of this, you know, iNaturalist, all of these uh, app-based and data-based citizen science, works basically through the internet, and we're able to do this because of the internet and because we have massive computing power that can actually you know, handle incredible amounts of data and synthesize and analyze that, that data. So this is just launched a couple days ago by some professors at the University of California at San Francisco. And what they're asking people to do is to sign up for this app and to say you know, how old you are, what kind of health you're in, what, um, what your sex is, and then to keep that uh, updated with your health. So you saw all of those pictures of how the virus was moving across the earth from that one visualization. That data is from like hospitals and testing centers, but it's not at the finer scale of who is getting it, who is recovering, and how is it perhaps being transmitted. So this kind of data will zero in on those questions. This is another one that's very similar um, that Harvard Medical School is doing with Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, they're tracking, you know, who's getting it when, what's the onset, and asking people to contribute how they're experiencing it themselves. So this is a case of a kind of citizen science where what you do is contribute your own data to somebody else's analysis. This is a very different kind of citizen science that is really fascinating and um, it's also now focused on COVID, and this is a project called Fold It. So Fold It is a project of the University of Washington, and it's basically a computer game kind of um, platform for making virus uh, protein structures, and viruses are, have a protein structure. So they enjoin people to play this game and make all of these different um, possible uh, structures of viruses. This is just the folded Wikipedia site because I found it more 
um, easy to understand how fold it works by reading this than really even by reading their website. Although I was at a conference a couple months ago where the fold it people spoke. Uh, this has been around for a number of years. Many important discoveries, disease discoveries have been made through fold it. The human brain has more flexibility and more intuition than computers do and actually can figure out uh, protein structures better than computers can. Computers can do a lot of kind of processing better than we can. And so these are explanations of how what you do for, for Fold It really work. So I was super surprised, but most of their users are women. There's just slightly more women than men doing Fold It. Many uh, more of them are middle-aged and, and very few of them have science degrees. So um, I'm not gonna say just like a middle-aged lady like me can do it, anybody can do it, but I kind of actually think that's true. So here's another citizen science story that gets uh, more at the science of uh, biodiversity and evolution, but also in a way that really impacts how we live today and the kinds of struggles that we have with biodiversity. So this is a Pieris rapi butterfly. It's a common white butterfly. If it is not the most ubiquitous butterfly in the world, it is number two. And uh, this citizen science project, the Pieris project, uh, was a bunch of geneticists that wanted to understand how did this butterfly proliferate around the globe? Because they knew that basically the oldest uh, population, the original population of PRS was in China, ancient um, population in China, but then it has proliferated around the world. So how you can tell, this is, um, this is a little uh, detail from a Vincent van Gogh painting, white butterfly with irises. So we know that there were white butterflies in Europe when Vincent van Gogh was painting because of this, essentially. But in order to understand how did it proliferate around the earth, this scientist and a bunch of other scientists asked people around the world to help them collect those butterflies, collect white butterflies, and send them in to the lab. And because they are such an abundant butterfly, they're considered a pest. Um, there's a lot of effort to eradicate them in agricultural fields. The, there's qualms about actually you know, collecting living beings but, and killing them, which you do to do this. But, but with the, this white butterfly, it was felt like it's not such a bad one to do this with and we can really help um, figure things out if we do this genetic research that we need their bodies for. So these markers, uh, these different colored dots are different genetic strains of this PRS, but they're related to each other and you can tell which ones are the oldest, the original ones, by looking at the genetics. So this up there says 25 and Pierre's, like 25 and me. Just like you might you know, do your own DNA and try to figure out your ancestry, this is doing the same thing. And one thing that has been uncovered by this project is that one of the major dispersals of the PRS happened when the Silk Road was built and China was basically open to Europe for trade. And also this has uh, correlated with the cultivation for agriculture of this group of vegetables that we still all eat, uh, cauliflower, bok choy, cabbage. And this is what the butterfly loves to eat and why it's considered a pest, because the, uh, the caterpillar predates on this plant and eats it when it's the very hungry caterpillar and destroys a fair amount of the crop every year. And then um, this is, you know, this is why I like this story because of these threads of history in it. If you see down half the page, it says the introduction and spread of Pierce Rapi in North America by Samuel Scudder. Well, Samuel Scudder, you know, in the 1800s, he lived in the US. He wanted to, he saw that there was this invasive butterfly and he wanted to know how it got to the States. So he asked, he asked, he put out little notices and all these little bug aficionado journals asking people to collect the butterflies and send them to him. This is citizen science, right? So in the 1800s, people did essentially what they're doing today and sent him those butterflies. And he uh, figured out looking at the butterflies morphology, not that's their body shape, not at the genetics because they didn't know about genetics yet. And he came up with his hypothesis, which turned out to be pretty provable about how they came to the States this is like, this is what's on the Internet Archive. This is like how these, this book was scanned. 
but he made a map and you can kind of see his marks there into the Midwest of Nebraska, Kansas, and Texas of where he saw PRS Raphae at that time in the 1800s. And then this is a visualization and actually earlier today, this actually worked in real time. Um, see if I can go back. This is a, a visualization of the, the building of the transcontinental railroad. And when the railroad got all the way to the West Coast, so did the PRS Raphae. So essentially you see that this, this butterfly has tracked um, human trade routes for hundreds of years and is really just as much a story of humanity as it is of a butterfly. And it has everything to do with transportation and with agriculture. And basically transportation and agriculture remain today these extremely uh, big impacts on biodiversity for the same kinds of reasons. So now I'm gonna shift gears entirely-ish the imagination is one of the forces of nature. And for any of you who might be English teachers or uh, want to sort of think about what I want to do sometimes is think about, you know, literature. Does it mean anything anymore? Can it mean anything anymore? Um, because we're in such dire straits that everything that we thought of as true is kind of up for revision. Wallace Stevens, a beautiful poet of nature, of philosophically minded. This is a poem, don't try to read it, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. So I took this poem and I asked myself, it's a beautiful poem looking at a blackbird from more than 13 ways, almost infinite ways. Um, he's a beloved poet who wrote and lived in Hartford, Connecticut in the 1920s and beyond. But people who loved Wallace Stevens have made a walk from his historical home to his office and made 13 stops along the way. So there today you can go take this walk. And there's a stanza of the poem on each step of the way. So I asked myself, okay, well, what, what blackbird would Wallace Stevens have been seeing in 1920s in, in Connecticut? And I asked some ornithologists who showed me some distribution maps and they showed me this reason and that reason and said, probably the rusty blackbird. So I said, okay, I'm gonna look into the rusty blackbird. What is going on with the rusty blackbird? And I found out that it was actually in a big serious decline. So this is a paper that came out in 1999, and I was shocked and delighted to find that this guy, Sam Drogi, you can see his name there as one of the authors. Sam Drogi is one of uh, the, the very most wonderful people of citizen science. I wrote a chapter essentially about his work in my book on citizen science. There he is in his lab. He has the gray uh, beard and hair. And Sam Drogi, he's mostly focused on, focused on bees now, but he was doing a lot of bird surveying and asked himself, why am I not seeing as many rusty blackbirds as there used to be? And um, the thing is that you've heard these statistics about bird declines, and we've had bird declines over decades, but even avid birders weren't worried about the rusty blackbird because they thought it was so common that there could be no problem with it. So not only was actually Wallace Stevens not looking at the blackbird at all, but neither were birders until Sam Drogi actually took a look at it. But here's the beauty of citizen science. Because there was data taken for 100 plus years, we could look backwards to tell the story. Even though we didn't know to ask the question when we should have, we could still now go back and reconstruct what happened and is happening to the rusty blackbird using that citizen science data. So the way through the world is more difficult to find than the way beyond it. I love that because, um, he couldn't possibly have known really how true that is because he didn't know really that he wasn't even finding his way through the world at all because he wasn't even really looking at it. He was only looking at his own mind. <laughs> and this is the trouble with the humanities. Like we are looking at the human mind and we are not incorporating the physical world. And that's what I want citizen science to help do. So here is um, Samuel Scudder again. He published all kinds of um, beautiful, beautiful documentation of butterflies in the eastern United States. So that the wing pattern on the top is actually the, the view from the back of the butterfly, and the, the, uh, the lower wing is the view from the front. This is a Vanessa Cardoi, or a painted lady. And I'm showing this to you because they're, they're starting to migrate now, and they uh, are coming in the thousands from the south, 
and they are coming up the coast of California, but they also come, they're, they're a very widely di distributed butterfly. So they, I took this from iNaturalist this morning. These are observations of painted ladies in the tri-state area. So this is a butterfly you can go out and see uh, and look for. People think it's a monarch. It's not a monarch. It's smaller than a monarch, and it's the, the, the design on it is more intricate. It's less graphic and more intricate. And they're very beautiful. So they give you joy to see them. We help these butterflies that are beneficial for humans, which, which these are. Vanessa Carter, I help with pollination. Um, they're not like the Pieris rapi that, that hurt agriculture. These don't do anything bad. And they, they have these huge spurts of population, which then really help feed the rest of the ecosystem. And so we want to help them in their way. And then I will conclude back on the common muir and my daily trips down to um, down to Christie Field to see them. That's what they look like in the water, basically. Uh, this is a muir specimen from the California Academy of Sciences. And the, these are muir eggs that were collected from the academy in the, uh, in the late 1800s. So the muirs were uh, hunted to near extinction when the gold rush happened because people went out to the Farallons to get the eggs because they're great big eggs and uh, people were hungry for food. You know, there wasn't restaurants and there wasn't even farms or dairies really. So people used what was there and, and took so many eggs. Seabirds usually only lay one egg at a time. And then very early on, um, a big effort by amateurs to stop this predation on the, the muirs actually turned that extinction around. Now today, you know, seabirds have their problems because of global warming, ocean acidification, and the depletion of fisheries. But the truth is that when we turn the attention of a lot of people to helping support an organism and a life way, uh, we are successful. And you know what COVID is teaching us, like an object lesson in, is uh, well, there's no separation here. You know, it's not us and them; it's all us. And and this beautiful cycle of life is the thing that we all have to work together to sustain. And doing that, uh, even by making a little observation every day, feels good. It's helpful. So I'll stop right there. Thanks. And I think the one question in the meantime that we had posed on um, by Bianca on chat was whether or not the COVID numbers in the animation were from iNaturalist. And in the course of your presentation, Mary Ellen, you answered that question that it was from hospitals and, um, and other institutions. That's a good question, you know, uh, no. And iNaturalist is a great tool for, um, for a lot of different kinds of observation. Uh, it's not at the level, when, when they get that data from people using their smartphones to tell them how they're doing, when we get really, really good data about who gets it when, how long they're sick, um, that'll be at a finer scale of understanding than I think you could probably really get from my naturalist right now. And part of that is because they have the question. They're answering a single question. And our naturalist doesn't ask a single question. It's really like a gigantic database of everything that we are, are just giving data into. Excellent. So uh, Kevin, let's turn to you. Kevin Roan. Hi, thanks again for that wonderful talk. Um, I'm in, really interested in iNaturalist. I've used it before and had students make some observations and they really loved it. Um, I'm interested from the um, scientific perspective, what uh, you do in order to potentially deal with uh, inaccuracies in the data collected by citizen, citizen scientists and whether that's a concern and um, what's done in order to, to normalize that. So the whole, the whole way the app is set up is to try to get as accurate an observation as possible. So that's why, why you get a photograph of something and then the date and the app geolocates that. So that means you get the date, the time, the latitude and the longitude. So the latitude and the longitude come from GPS, from the satellites that are circling around the globe and the time comes from the atomic clock. And then you've got the photograph 
Um, there's an artificial intelligence function on iNaturalist that is recognizing a lot of the species, but not all of them, and sometimes it's wrong. But then that observation goes up uh, to the speed, and people are, there's, there's just as many people using it to help verify observations as there are people making the observations. But the absolute use of the data comes when you have so much data that any kind of anomaly in the data becomes statistically insignificant. And that can be true for certain projects on iNaturalist now. Um, there's something called reptiles and amphibians of Southern California, um, rascals. I suggest you look at that and also Google it. Uh, there's a little um, iNaturalist video by Greg Pauly, the scientist who runs that, about uh, how and why using iNaturalist is really exploding what we're knowing about how nature operates. But he's getting so much data on reptiles and amphibians in a, in a, in a smaller located bounded area that if somebody gets one lizard ID wrong, it's statistically insignificant because there were 400 that were right. And that's, but that's the power of big data. That's why you have to have it big data. You can't just have a few observations. Excellent. Matt, um, I'm wondering if we can call on you to, uh, to ask uh, the question that you've just posed in chat, which I think is a really wonderful one. Sure, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, the, is, any suggestions, I was wondering, about anything we could ask our students to do, uh, citizen science related, um, while being inside, uh, as right now the, the line from um, the, the mayor's office is that uh, we have no spring break because teachers are used to keep students inside. Um, and so I don't want to necessarily encourage outdoor activities at the moment, even though that's healthy um, in its own regard, but whether it's like uh, data crunching of things that are already existing or being able to snap photos from our windowsill um, or things like this, any ideas? Well, there's something called Zooniverse, uh, Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E, -E and Zooniverse is a big platform of so citizen science projects that are mostly around identifying images or cataloging or transcribing. And some of them are really fun to do, like um, there's a, a number of them in Africa where there's, you know, reserves are using motion activated cameras to really understand where the animals on their reserves are when. But there are so many, they generate so many hundreds of thousands of images that they can't possibly, scientists can't go through them all. So basically you train yourself by doing it to identify the species. I've done a couple of them and it becomes really fun. Like there'll be 20 different kinds of antelope in one reserve. And um, there's a little key of this is how you tell this antelope from that one. And then as I keep doing it, I'm beginning to recognize these different species of antelope. And I start to feel like that's fun and that I'm learning something. I'm, and then I become more intrigued with that um, ecosystem. So this is a kind of trans, you know, it's, it's photo identification. Uh, Zooniverse also has some projects to help transcribe different kinds of um, scientific data that's handwritten on labels. That could be hard depending on the kid. Some kids would love that. Other kids would not love that. Um, so Zooniverse is great. Um, you know, I feel like, yeah, I think a windowsill kind of observation of um, something called the Great Sunflower Project. See, we're really lucky it's spring right now because you, I don't know if she's sending out um, sunflower seeds right now. But if you look up some bee and pollinator citizen science, some of that is really looking at flowers for a certain number of minutes of the day and, and then making note of how many bees are on it. And then, and so you can do that. And um, the, I mentioned in my TED talk, Journey North. Journey North does have this, you know, monarch migration um, going on on it, but it also has a bunch of other migration, migrations to track. And one, you know, project that I have not really looked into yet, but I can't wait to do so, is about the, the daylight. So actually tracking when daylight breaks every day and when this, you know, when daylight is gone. And what's really cool about that is, is getting, if you can build some kind of, you know, lesson plan around how the earth is moving around the sun. 
And that is what is creating the seasons. And that's what's creating growth in the spring of photosynthesis. And so that is the mechanism by which life on earth exists, is that sun and the earth. And then so when you start really cluing in to that daylight, you're kind of getting to the pulse of nature. I mean, stuff like that. Fantastic. Uh, Emily, would you like to jump in and, um, and tell us about the project that you did with Zooniverse? Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, so in my animal behavior class, I did one project um, as kind of a lab last year that basically I let the kids pick whichever animal related Zooniverse project they found most interesting. And so I saw a lot of different ones. A lot of them have to do with the camera traps, uh, like she was talking about. There was one where they could listen to recordings and look at spectrograms and try to identify manatee sounds. Um, there was another one where they had to count shorebirds um, or seals and baby seals and different pictures. And so um, I kind of designed a lab around that and asked them to keep track of how many different observations they made and what the big scientific question was that they were helping to answer with that. It was really fun. They liked it a lot. That's really great. You know, one of the things that I find um, is kind of important using, like you, you we were wonderful of you to say, what big scientific question are they trying to answer here? Um, because some, sometimes these projects can be very, um, you know, functional, but without a context. And if they don't have a context, you know, even the kids are going to be like, I don't know why I'm doing this. So in a way, I was saying to my breakout group earlier, I think citizen science needs to go another step. We're not creating enough context for why we're asking people to do whatever, even asking people to do iNaturalist. Like, if I'm just taking pictures of iNaturalist and, and I don't know where that data is going or what it's being used for, um, unless I'm really a nature nut and there's a lot of nature nuts, um, I might lose interest in doing it. I feel like there's, there's a whole space for creating a narrative of context for why we need to understand these animals. I like it that it was, you know, this animal behavior. Look at this project called uh, Wild Book online. It's not something you can really contribute to, although it uses citizen science, but it also is using artificial intelligence and citizen science to really um, make this incredible progress in what we know about animal behavior. And it's, it's one of those hints that as we get all this data, what we know about the natural world is exploding. I mean, just think about like the fact that we really Darwin based what his life, you know, world altering observations on really a fairly small amount of specimens. You know, and scientists can't go into my, you know, my, on my deck. This is why the Greg Pauly video is good because he's like, no scientists could go to everybody's backyards. But we, when we get a picture of all the backyards, <laughs> then we see what's really going on out there. And it's, there's a lot of difference to what we thought was going on and what is going on. I think we have time for just one more question. And Karine, I think you had a question you'd like to pose. Hi, sorry, I keep, to, I seem to be getting dropped from the call. So if, if I drop out again, just let me know. But my question was originally, um, so I teach sustainable development and, and more geopolitics. And there've been a lot of questions from my students about um, privacy um, when giving things around, you know, data around their temperatures and some of the things that you mentioned. There's a lot of, um, uh, I think anxiety and fear circulating amongst the students that this is one of the ways in which governments are now collecting more and more data in ways that then could be um, questionable. Well, it's a huge issue. There's no doubt about it. Um, actually, iNaturalist developed an app called Zoom. Um, and they, they developed the app so that it could be used by kids who are under age uh, because there was a concern that pedophiles could track you, students, you know, young people using iNaturalist because it geolocates you, right? So Zoom does not geolocate you. Um, and also it's very cool. Oh no, it's not called Zoom, it's called Seek. I'm sorry, we're on Zoom. It's called Seek. So with Seek, you put the phone over something and actually the artificial intelligence just works right away and says, that's a monkey flower. 
Um, the trouble with it is that it doesn't really create data that's then useful for science because it's not geolocating it and we need the geolocation. So you're not collecting um, data that's useful, but you're learning and you're getting, um, you know, you're, you're, you're figuring things out. Uh, you know, that's a gigantic question about what everybody's going to use this data for and how. Um, I haven't looked at the UCSF or the Harvard Medical School apps to the degree of where they will hopefully be aware of that and say that they will never um, give your data away for any reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hazard out there for sure.